Hallelujah. Well, praise God. Are you ready for the word today? Yes. Are you ready for the word today? Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We've been talking about uh, rebuilding the broken places in our lives. And we've been on this. We've been talking about rebuilding the broken place of prayer. And we've been talking about uh, the prayer, uh, different types of prayer and the Lord's Prayer, what we call the Lord's Prayer. Last week I concluded that. Amen. How many of y'all watched that online? Amen. Out of the comfort of your home. That is so good because it was so good because I closed it up, rounded everything up and closed it up. So today I want to jump into the last part of prayer because there are certain things that we have to talk about in prayer to understand prayer. In order to rebuild the place of prayer, you have to understand what understand what prayer is. Say, I have to know what prayer is. Amen. Because how can I rebuild it if I don't know what it is? How can I do it if I don't understand it? Amen. So let's go ahead and jump in. We're going to jump in 1 Corinthians 3 and 10. We're going to start at 1 Corinthians 3 and 10. This has been our springboard scripture. It's where we've been jumping from. Amen. We'll have it up on the screen for you. And we want to kind of build this place because what I'm going to talk about today is sort of like a sort of like a touchy subject. Amen. And so I have to take my time to get there because if I don't, we will misunderstand what we're trying to say. You know, in church, what we've done is we've learned so many things and we've seen so many things. So sometimes when someone introduces something to you, we, we, we kind of say, ah, just like the prayer. When we were talking about prayer, when I gave you the Lord's Prayer, see, when I started breaking down all the different elements of the prayer, then it started looking different to you, right? All right. So let's look at 1 Corinthians 3 and 10. This is our springboard scripture. It says, according to the grace which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another build it thereupon. But let every man take heed how he build it there, there, thereupon. So every man has to take heed on how he builds. And so he says, I like what he says because he tells us that God has given him the grace to be a wise master builder. And I've been saying this for four weeks now. If God gave him the grace to be a wise master builder, then God has also given you the grace to be a wise master builder too. Because he goes on to say, but let every man take heed how he build it upon. So every man is building. Oh, you got to catch this. Every man is building, whether you're building in the natural, whether you're building in the spiritual, whether you're building for yourself or whether you're building for God, every man is building. You are a builder, but God has given you the grace to be a wise master builder so that you can build upon the things of God, but also build upon the things of the world. Come on, somebody, because God wants you to be successful in the world. But before we're able to step out and build worldly things, we have to first build spiritual things. Amen. So verse number 11, it says, for other foundation can no man lay that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So we we've, we've understand that when we rebuild the broken places, we're rebuilding places and we have a foundation of Jesus Christ. So we look right here. The stage is a foundation of sorts. Right. And the foundation that is built is Jesus Christ. So everything that we build up from there has to be on the foundation of him. See, the problem is we start building on the foundation of my job and we start building on the foundation of my ego and we start building on the foundation of my family and we start building on all these other foundations and we've never laid or built upon the foundation of Jesus Christ. Because when I build on Jesus Christ, I first build in the spiritual. I cannot be successful as a Christian in the natural unless I first establish the spiritual. Come on, somebody. So we were talking about rebuilding the broken place of prayer. This all started when we were talking about Nehemiah rebuilding the wall in Jerusalem. The broken place in Jerusalem was the wall. And because he went back, God, God gave him a burden. How did he receive his call? Through a, oh, this is a good class. He received his call through a burden. And so when he went, he went back to build the walls of Jerusalem because they were broken, because they were damaged, 
because they were fractured, because they were down. And we said whenever the walls are down, that gives the enemy access to come in and go out whenever he pleases. That's why we're wrestling with ourselves, talking about why I keep doing what I'm doing, why I can't stop going to the spot. Why I keep making this call at 1230? Why? Because you walls are broken down. You have some damaged places in your life, and now it's time to rebuild. It's time to rebuild. So we established that the first place that we needed to rebuild was prayer. And oh my God, we talked about that for about four weeks. How can you stay on one scripture for three weeks? But we did. Did y'all hear the close out last week? Oh my God. Man, I was, woo, I was dancing all in my office. Because God started giving me revelation and showing me different things. But see, he don't give it to me for me. He gave it to me. For you. So see, we all come up. Not that I have some stuff and then I walk around and, and try to act like, man, I know some stuff. Man, I don't know nothing unless the Spirit has showed me. Amen. And he told me that it's not for me. Everything that I have is for Come on, somebody. So I can't get puffed up. Because the, the moment that I realize that what I'm giving is not for, it's not for you, then guess what? It's going to dry up. Woo! Yeah, you, you ever see some people that you know that they were that they were amazing? You talk to them and you'd be like, they're the smartest person in the room. Yeah. But when they anointing dried up, mm. you catch them about five years down the road, and you'd be like, what happened to that person? Mm -hmm. That's why Paul said that we don't get puffed up. Mm -hmm. Because if I think that I'm higher than what I am, then what I do is I, I walk around like I'm somebody, mm -hmm. but I'm nobody. Trying to tell everybody. Come on, somebody. So we've been talking about rebuilding the broken place of prayer. So what are we building? We are building a spiritual house on the foundation of Jesus Christ. So how do we build? We use, see, write this down. For those of you who are taking notes, write this down. How do we build? We build using the principles of the word of God. Principles. Do you understand? And I know that most of you that have been following us. Do you understand that everything in the Bible is a principle? We live off principle living. So how do we build? We take the principles and then we build upon the principles. When we begin to establish principles, see, we just did tithes and offering. Tithes and offering is a principle. Oh, this is a good class. Let's open the book test. You only fail if you don't open the book. So tithes and offering is a principle. Because if I give, this is the principle. Watch this. Do you understand the principle is a law? It, a, a principle is a law. It's no different than Newton's theory, right? That what goes up? So if I give, this is the principle. It shall be given unto me. Good measure, press down, sing it together. Running over shall men give unto my... That's a law. So how do I build? On the foundation, I find the principle, and then I start operating in the principle. It's too easy. See, we want to be Christ-like, but we don't want to do nothing like Christ. So we have to build upon the principles. Let's go to Matthew 13 and 9. And, and I want to read this. I want to read this out of the uh, New International Standard Bible, NASV. Yeah, we got some Bibles back there for y'all. So y'all can see this stuff. NASB. Here we go. Ooh, we cooking with Crisco. Watch this, y'all. Y'all ready? It says, the ones who have ears, let him what? The ones who have... Now, do you have ears? That's the question. Do you have an ear? Because he says, those who have ears, let him hear. So obviously he wasn't talking about regular ears. He's talking about spiritual ears. So he's saying, okay, the ones who have ears, let him hear. Verse number 10. And the disciples came unto him and said, why do you speak to them in parables? Can I tell you, he was speaking to everybody in parables. He said, why do you speak to them in parables? And Jesus answered them, and he said, to you it has been granted to know the mysteries 
of the kingdom of heaven. But to them, it has not been granted. Can, can, I, can I say that one more time? Because, see, I love, I love to read other versions of the Bible because other versions of the Bible allow, allow me to see things just a little bit more clearly. See, the King James is saying the same thing, but these words make it clear. I want, I want y'all to understand something. He says, to you, you born-again believer you, you Holy Ghost filled thank you, you child of God you, you son of the most high you, to you. It has been granted to know the mysteries of the who? Kingdom of what? What did I tell you heaven was? What did I tell you heaven was? And you have access to the kingdom. You have, your access has been granted. See, we've been reading the Bible, but we haven't, act, we haven't turned on our ears to hear. We haven't turned on our eyes to see. So we've just been reading over it. But can I tell you, you have access granted. To you, it has been granted to know the mysteries. Can, so, so let's stop right there. Do you understand that everything that he is saying is a mystery? And so you have been granted access to understand the mysteries. See, the reason why people don't understand what God is saying, because to them it's foolishness. But unto you, access has been granted. See, when we leave out of here, having a greater understanding of what God is talking about, it's because access has been so when you read the Bible, this is what I want you to do. When you start reading it, I want you to say to yourself, I have, I have been granted access to know the mysteries. That's why, oh man, I don't want to get into this prayer because this prayer is so deep. He says, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. But if I don't know what's going on in heaven, then I can't get earth to look like heaven. Because it's a mystery to me. But you have access that's been granted to understand the mystery of the kingdom of heaven. That's why he always says the kingdom of heaven is like. What he's telling you is find this mystery out and you'll understand what heaven is like. Yes. Oh, that's a old hand clapper right there. Let me just hand clap myself. <laughs> so... He says, but unto them, but unto you, it has been granted to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. But unto them, it has not been granted. Unto them. So it's us and them. Somebody say it's us and them. Are you going to be one of the us's? Or are we going to be one of the them's? <laughs> See, because when I operate as a us, I have access granted. But when I operate as them, it's foolishness. Come on, somebody. Verse number 13. Therefore, I speak to them in parables. Because while seeing, they do not see. He said while seeing. So they're looking. And while they're looking at what they're looking at, they can't see it. They, 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 <laughs> because they don't have access. They have not been granted access to see it. Mm -hmm. So they're looking at it. And they're looking at it. Look, can I tell you, they're they looking at you and trying to figure out how you so blessed. Oh. They're looking at you and they're looking at you and they say, well, how you got so much joy? Yeah. You tell them the joy of the Lord is mine. Yeah. They're looking at you and they're trying to figure out how you got so much peace. Yeah. Because he's the Prince of Peace. Yeah. He is my peace. Yeah. And you got so much love because he is love. Yeah. And he is. In me. Yes, indeed. While seeing, they do not see. And while hearing, they do not hear, nor do they understand. Mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. Heaven is a kingdom, and we have access to understand the mysteries of that kingdom. Remember, I told you, uh, what did he say? We have the keys to the kingdom? Yes. What did, is that what he told Peter? He told Peter, and I will give you. See, we already did this now. We we didn't talk about this for about three weeks. Yeah. I'm just I'm just I'm just throw this out there because it's open book test. Yeah. He said unto Peter, what? I will give you the keys to what? Kingdom. Kingdom of what? Heaven. I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And he said, whatever you allow down here on earth, 
it'll come from heaven. Whatever you bind and whatever you lose, right? That's what he said. He said, because you got the keys. You got the keys to unlock your blessing. You got the keys to unlock the mystery. You got the keys to unlock the healing. You got the keys to heaven. Thank you, Lord. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Because you got the keys. Wait till we get on this series, Kingdom Keys. Keys to unlock and keys to lock. Right? That's what binding and loosening is. Locking and unlocking. Everybody got a key to this door, got access. Can I tell you, you don't have access granted without having a key. All right, all right, all right. Let's go to 2 Peter 1 and 2. We'll go back to the King James Version. Second Peter 1 and 2. Amen. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and our Lord Jesus and Jesus our Lord. According as his divine power has given unto us what? All things that pertain to what? Come on, come on, everybody. I want y'all to read it. Y'all see it? According to his divine power has given unto us all things pertaining unto life and He's given us all things that pertain to two things. All right. Through the knowledge of him that called us to the glory of his virtue. Verse number four. Whereby are given unto us exceedingly great, precious promises. Oh, man, he was a whole bunch of words to get the promise, right? Whereby are given unto us. Let's, let's take us out. When we read that, I want y'all to say, Where, whereby was given unto me. Y'all ready? Come on, let's read. Whereby are given unto me exceeding great precious promises Ooh, that by these I might be a partaker of the what? Divine. I might be a partaker of his divine nature. See, we don't read these scriptures when we come to church. By these we might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the, cor the corruption that is in this world through lust. So let's look at this. All things that pertain to life, life is natural. Right? We live what? Life. And every day we just live in life. So we live life in the natural. And what is godliness? Godliness is godlikeness. Do y'all know that? That's what the word is, a compound word. Godliness really means God likeness. That's how we're able to partake in his divine nature because he has given us everything to be God-like. Okay, see, now we're going to argue with that. Now, we ain't like God. But when he created us in Genesis 1, 26, he said he created man in his own image and in his what? God likeness. So are you created in his likeness or not? Mm -hmm. When we receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and personal Savior, we take on his divine nature. Oh, come on, somebody. See, I, that's why I have an issue with when we go around and we saying, you know, that you know I'm a wretch undone. No, I was a wretch undone. Yes. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Yes. That's who I am. You keep trying to remind me of who I was. Oh, yes. Who I was don't matter no more because who I is. See, when I understand who I is, that override who I was. Amen, somebody. So godliness or godlikeness is spiritual. So when we read this, he's really saying, I have given you everything pertaining to the natural and the spiritual. I've given you everything that pertains to how you build naturally and how you, how you build spiritually. I've given you everything that pertains, that concerns, that is in conjunction with, that lines up with anything that is natural, life, and anything that is God-like. Ooh-wee. See, the more I understand, the more I partake of his divine nature, not of my human nature. Because, see, I've been living in my human nature for a long time. And some of us was, you know, we've been living in the human nature. We've been living life for 30 years. And then all of a sudden now, I got this divine nature in me. And now I got to figure out how to walk in that. 
And so I've never learned how to walk like a Christian or be God-like because I've been so I've been so trained. I've been on automatic pilot in this world system for so long. It's hard for me to adjust to the new system. Come on, somebody. That's why, I, listen, can I tell y'all a secret? Don't tell nobody this, right? Don't tell nobody this. That's why I don't judge people. I don't care if you drink. Can I tell you that? Don't, don't be mad at me. Don't be mad at me. Don't send me no email. I don't care if you drink. What they got to do with me? They got to do with you. Exactly. You got to work out your own. I don't care if you smoke. I don't care if you cuss. I'd rather you slip one out in front of me than, than, than go on behind me and then, you know, round them off. I'd rather know who, what, you know, what you're working with. Come on, somebody. Yes. Because then it gives me an idea where you're at, and then it helps me know what to pray for you. Yes. Yes. Amen? Yes. Amen. No, I don't, I don't judge people. I don't, don't do it. That's the stuff. I'm, I'm, I'm way bigger than that. Right. Come on, we got to get bigger than that. Yes. See, and, and we've been keeping people out of yep. being God-like because we've been coming to church and we've been telling them how bad they are, oh. how terrible they are, what you were doing last night. And you can't wear that. You can't do this. And now I don't even want to come back. Oh, come on back, baby. Give me a year. I'm going to tell you what, in a whole year, if you ain't changed your whole... <laughs> then I don't know what to tell you. But I tell you, if you get this word up on inside of you, you start to learn the principles of God. You start to learn who you is. And we don't tell nobody who they is. So, we understand that we have exceedingly great promises, right? And so here's where we go. We must rebuild the broken place of prayer. Let's go to Luke 11 and 11. We started off at Luke 11 and 1. After we started off at Matthew, right? Yep. Then we went to Luke. Looked at the Lord's Prayer. If y'all did not catch that, go on Facebook and look at the last three, four messages. I'm telling you, it'll change your prayer life. Change your prayer life. All right. Luke 11 and 11. This is the end of Jesus. So when they came to Jesus and asked him to teach him how to pray, he took them all the way from 11 and 1 all the way down to 11 and 13. See, we thought that when he said teach us how to pray, uh, I got I, I to gotta put this, because when, when we thought, remember we said seeing that they may see, why do you teach them in parables? When we thought that, that he was teaching them something to recite, he was just telling them a parable. And he was saying that the mystery of prayer is in what I'm telling you. Y'all see it, right? The mystery of prayer. Not that our Father who art in heaven. No, our Father, source and sustainer. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes. They had never known God as him as Father. They had only known him as God. So this is, it's a parable to them. It's a mystery. What are you talking about, our Father? They never heard this before. This is blasphemy. Come on, somebody. No, you're, you're talking to people who have done something a certain way for so long. Thy kingdom come. Thy kingdom come. What, what, we're looking for a kingdom to come. Help us get out of this doggone oppression we in. So they didn't understand what he was saying. So when they asked him to pray, he gave them another story. <laughs> but it was up to us to come back and figure out the mystery. So what we do last three weeks? Unveil the mystery. Forgive us our sins, right? As we forgive those. What does it say when you stand praying? Forgive, for, confess your faults. He is faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you of all unrighteousness. He wasn't just saying say that. No, he said, what'd you do? And then you got to go back and forgive other people. In your prayer. Lord, I forgive my mom and them. They ain't that crazy, Lord. I forgive my cousin and them. My uncle and them that was touching on me when I was little. Come on, somebody. Come on, we got to get with everything. Yes. See, there's some things we don't want to let go of. I was talking to my mother-in-law. We were talking about how rooms, people have rooms in their house that you can't go in. And that's what we do, God. You come on in the house, you take your shoes off, you go to their room. But they got that room with the real nice furniture. Can't nobody go in there and sit on. Got the real nice plates nobody can eat on. And that's how we do God. Yes. That's a parable in your life to say that I got an area in my life that nobody can't get into. Oh. <laughs> I 
I got some things in my life nobody can't partake of. These places, these places for looking at. This furniture for looking at. Let's move on. Let's move on. Well, I told y'all to go. We had Luke 11 and 11, right? So this whole story is prayer. He says, he tells him, he says, hey, when you go to a friend's house, right? Remember the story? I told you, right? Remember? He says, when you go to a friend's house, right? Because somebody that came to your house, just paraphrasing, because if not, I'm going to start reading this stuff and I'm going to start talking about it. He said, when you go to a friend's house, he said, it's because of your persistence, right? That when you go and your persistence is the reason why he gets up and he'll go and get you some bread to feed, help you feed your visitors. All right, and we've learned that in America, we sleep on beauty rest black. <laughs> and everybody got their own room. But I hope I got a couple of people that grew up in, grew up in here that, you know, you, your cousin, them, everybody was sleeping in the same bed, yeah, yeah, one this way, yeah, one that way. Yeah, yeah. yeah your feet all in your face in the morning. Because yeah. 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 I knew I grew up in a house, it was nine of us in a shotgun house. No, no, no. Somebody sleeping in every room. But I have to let you understand that in, in, in the Middle East, what it is, is, is they may have two or three rooms. Right. That's their whole house. Right. So everybody in the whole family live up in the house. Yeah. And it may be two, three families. Yeah. And so everybody is sleeping on the floor. Yeah. See, see, they don't have beauty rest black. Mm -hmm. yeah. They get that mat, they roll that mat out. Mm -hmm. yeah. And when it's time to go to bed, everybody going to lay down. Y'all want to know how I know this? Because I was kicking down doors at 2 o'clock in the morning, stepping over people. <laughs> Tell them, get up. No, no, no. God gave me a revelation in the middle of combat mm -hmm. to let me understand. He said, listen, he didn't, he was his friend, but the reason why he didn't get up is because once he got up, he was gonna wake everybody else up. Because I gotta step over this person, step Amen. over this person to get to the kitchen. Then when I get to the kitchen, I gotta step over this person, step over that person to get back to you. Mm -hmm. it, it was all. He was telling them all a story, a parable. The whole chapter is prayer, not just the Our Father part. Can you get that? The whole chapter. He said, teach us how to pray. So he gave him a whole chapter. This is, this is what you do. Okay. <sighs> ooh, ooh, my time is gone. Okay, Luke 11, 11. We're about to run. Y'all ready to run? All right, put on your seatbelt because we're going to move fast. If a son shall ask bread of any of you that is a father, will you give him a stone? Or if you ask a fish, will for a fish give him a serpent? Or if he shall ask an egg, will you offer him a scorpion? Mm. If you then being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children. Okay, y'all ready for this? How much more shall your heavenly father give what? The Holy Spirit to them that ask. He said, he said, if you just ask for the Holy Spirit, he'll give it to you. He could have said they asked for food. He didn't say ask for food. He said ask for the Holy Spirit. Jesus said that I'm going and I'm going to send you a comforter. And then he, in the same chapter, he comes down and he says that the comforter is me. Y'all remember that? And the comforter is me. You mean you're going to send me a comforter? You're going to send me you again? And he said, all you have to do is ask. Do you have a father that will give you something that you didn't ask for? Oh, my God. So Paul is letting us know. Uh, let's go to uh, 1 Corinthians 13 and 1. 1 Corinthians 13 and 1. So first of all, all we have to do is, in order to enter into the spiritual, all we have to do is ask for it. When he was saying, ask for the Holy Spirit, he was really saying, watch this. He was really saying, he was really asking for the invitation to move into spiritual things. Because that's what the Holy Spirit does. Do you understand that when I receive Jesus Christ as my Lord and personal Savior, I receive the Holy Spirit. So if I have to ask for the Holy Spirit, what I'm asking for is I'm asking for now, watch this, the things to see in the spiritual realm. Mm. All right. Give me access. I have the Holy Ghost, but now I need access. Do y'all see this? Okay, let's, let's prove our case. 1 Corinthians 13 and 1. Though I speak with tongues of men and angels, because we're going to start talking about controversial subject, right? We're going to start talking about prayer. 
We're rebuilding the broken place of prayer. So Paul says, 13 and 1, though I speak with tongues of men and of angels. Let's stop right there. See, we always go on to the next part and have not charity. See, we focus on we don't have love. That ain't the focus. The focus is, though I speak with tongues of men and angels. In other words, Paul is saying, man, I, I, can, speak the, I can speak like a man and I can speak like a Wow. That's the revelation Paul is giving you. That your, that your spiritual prayer language is an angelic language. And an angelic language is a spiritual language. Yes. Oh, y'all got me working hard. Y'all got me working hard because watch this. We, we have thought... Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. Paul saying that I can speak in the two realms. I can speak in a natural realm and I can speak into a spiritual realm. God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him with what? So if God is a spirit and if I worship him in spirit, then I can also pray to him in spirit. Laying the foundation. Laying the foundation. That's all I'm doing. 2 Corinthians 12 and 2. Just laying the foundation. 2 Corinthians 12 and 2 says, I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell. God knows. Such one was caught up into the where? Third heaven. It's caught up into the third heaven. Verse number three. And I know such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, but God knows. Verse number four. How that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which were not lawful for man to utter. Let me, let me stop right there because what I'm trying to show you is that Paul was able to speak a language that, no, that other men were not even, was not even lawful for other men to speak. Because he's really saying, I know a man 14 years ago, he was caught up. He was caught up into the third heaven. Theologians, when I was in school, theologians say Paul was talking about himself. That Paul was actually caught up into the third heaven. And he actually saw the throne room of God. Can, can you remember what I said last, year, last week? I said last week that in the year King Uzziah died. Who was it? Isaiah? Isaiah said, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. He was sitting on a throne and his train filled the temple. And there was angels above him, seraphim, three wings. And they was flying and they would say, holy, holy, holy. Paul is saying, I had that same experience Isaiah had. And the only reason I can understand what they were saying, because God allowed me to understand the angelic language. But we think angels talk like us. 1 Corinthians 14 and 2. Am I laying the foundation? Yeah. <laughs> Let me just lay the foundation. First, uh, uh, 1 Corinthians 14 and 2 says, 14 and 2. It's not loaded? It's not loaded? All right, I'm going to read it to you while they work on that. It says, For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. For no man can understand him, howbeit he speaks mysteries. So no man can understand him, right? But he speaks mysteries. For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue, I'm going to change that word tongue to language. Is that all right? For he who speaks in an unknown language speaks not unto men, but unto God. For no man understands what he is saying, but God does. Because Paul, watch this. Let me go back to Paul. Y'all ready for Paul? Because Paul said this. He had the ability to do what? Speak like men and speak like angels. I can speak in the natural and I can speak into the spiritual. If I have access to heaven, then I also have to know the heavenly language. <sighs> all right, all right. 
Let me read 1 Corinthians 14 and 4 out of the Message Bible. Out of the Message Bible. Let's see if we got that one. Yeah, we got it. All right? Because this right here, you know, I start reading it. To, when I get a scripture, I start reading three, four different things to get an understanding of it. Then I come back. Okay, so here we go. And if y'all don't understand, this is teaching ministry. Because we need to learn something. Is that all right? All right. We need to have it too. I might move tonight. I don't know. The one who prays using what? Private. The one who prays using a what? Private. A private prayer language? Oh, I love this. The one who prays using a private prayer language certainly gets a lot out of it. But proclaiming God's truth to the church is its common language brings the whole church into growth and strength. I want all of you to develop intimacies with God in prayer, but please do not stop with that. Go on and proclaim his clear truth to others. It's more important that everyone have access to the knowledge and love of God in, in a language everyone understands. So if you read 1 Corinthians 14, the whole chapter is really about praying in an unknown tongue and how to do it in church. And so what we've done is we've taken the first part of the scripture and, and, and then we've, we've, we've gotten rid of the rest. Mm. Yeah, we don't have no protocol in church. Mm. Because your private prayer language is for you. When you pray in an unknown tongue, it don't help me. It helps you. When you go to pray with somebody, don't pray for them in tongues. Pray for them in English. Your tongue don't help them. Oh, come on, somebody. And so, since we've seen church done like that, we get a little skeptical. Then people, they're crazy. Everybody walking around speaking in tongues. But it's not for you. It's, it's for me. Do I have the ability to do it? Everyone in this room has, that has the Holy Spirit has the ability to do it. Watch this. You don't have to come up to the room and tarry. We don't have to lay hands on you. You don't have to stay here with the mothers. We ain't going to make you trick you and have you going, ba 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 saying some words real fast until you think you got something. No. Listen. The Holy Spirit, if you ask God for it, he'll give it to you. It's that easy. I asked him for salvation. He gave it to me. I asked him for healing. He gave it to me. So why do I need to tarry for some tongues? I ain't having to tear it for salvation. Amen. Free. <laughs> free, free, free. Free, free, free. Free, free, free. Amen. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 14 and 13. We'll go back to the King James Version. I like the Message Bible because it tells me that it's a private prayer. Mm -hmm. It's your own personal prayer language. That's what they keep telling us. Right? So I found it in the scripture. It's your own personal private prayer language. All right. 1 Corinthians 14 and 13. Y'all ready? Wherefore, let him that speaketh in an unknown tongue pray that he may what? Perfect. Not, 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 see, we can't take one scripture and then not take the rest. Mm -hmm. So even if I pray in an unknown tongue or an unknown language or an angelic language, can I say that? If I pray in an angelic language in the spiritual realm, I still need to ask that I get the interpretation of what I say. And so what we've been doing is we've been, we, we've been in church and we blurt it all out, all loud, trying to show that we are spiritual. Man, that ain't spiritual. You want to show me you're spiritual? Say it in English. Come on, somebody. Right? So look what he says. Wherefore, let him that speaketh in the angelic language pray that he also interpret. Why do I speak in tongues and then not know what in the world I'm talking about? Okay, okay. Verse number 14. Wherefore, if I pray in an angelic language, an unknown tongue, my what? Spirit pray. But my understanding is unfruitful. So I don't even know what I was praying for. Yeah, I don't even know what I was praying for. I was praying hard. I look real spiritual doing it. Come on, somebody. I look real spiritual doing it. And everybody that watches is like, man, that person's real spiritual. Because if you have not experienced being able to speak in your private prayer language, right, then you think everybody else that do, they even one or two things. 
They either real spiritual or they crazy. Now they crazy. Yeah. Right or wrong? Okay? So this is what I have to do. When I pray in my prayer language, because we're rebuilding the broken place of prayer, right? This is why I'm telling you this. Because now, for those that be praying in the Holy Ghost, those that be praying in the Spirit, watch this. Verse number 14, for if I pray in an unknown uh, like tongue, my spirit pray. That means I'm praying in the spirit. That means I'm praying where? In the spirit. But I also need to say, after I finish, what did I just pray? So that I can understand what the spirit was praying for. Verse number 15. What is it then? I will pray with the spirit and I will pray with the understanding also. Why? Because I said something and now I understand what I said. I prayed into the, I prayed into the, into the angelic realm, but I also understand what was praying in the angelic realm. I will pray with understanding also. I will sing in the spirit and I will sing with understanding also. Let's jump down to verse number 18. So look what Paul says. I thank my God that I speak with what? Tongues more than you all. No, where Paul was saying, man, I do this more than everybody. Right? Okay, let's also see what he says in verse number 19. Yet in the church. All right, so I'm kicking over some sacred cows right now. Because he said, I speak in tongues all the time. Because I can speak in tongues of men, and I can speak in tongues of angels. A little bit said, but when I'm in church. Uh, but when I'm in church, I will pray with the Spirit, and I will pray. He says, when I'm in church, I had rather speak five words with my understanding, that by my voice I might teach others also, than 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. Because if you read the rest of the chapter, he's saying, man, because people don't understand you, they say, them people crazy over there. <sighs> so in church, we speak with understanding. So I don't just get up here and just start, you know, talking in tongues. Because if I get up here and start talking in tongues, yeah, all y'all going to look at me in two things. Is he real spiritual or he crazy? <laughs> Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's go to Jude 1 and 20. So I had to put that in there because we've had some church experience. We didn't come up to the altar for prayer and then they had prayed in tongues for five minutes over me. Now, I, you know, I had my eyes closed. Now I'm looking like... And, you didn't, and, and watch this. The, my altar team. Here's the, here's the mistake of the people praying at the altar. They never came back and interpreted. Y'all get that? They never came back and interpreted what they said. Okay. All right. It's okay if you go off into a little thing and then you come back and then you correct. You, now, this is what was said. Mm -hmm. Don't make up what was said now. Right. Come on, somebody. Y'all with me? Y'all getting anything out of this? Because yeah. we got to rebuild the place of prayer. And if I'm going to pray in the spirit, because it says now when I pray... I pray with my spirit. If I'm going to pray with my spirit, then I need to understand what I'm praying. Yeah. Uh, Jude 1 and 20. Jude 1 and 20. But you, beloved, building yourself on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. Now, we already said that when you pray, that when I pray in an unknown language, I pray in the spirit. So that's also the Holy Ghost. So what happens when I pray in the Holy Ghost? The Holy Ghost helps, helps you build yourself up in faith. He is the comforter. He is the helper. He is the encourager. When you are lacking in faith, begin to pray in your prayer, your, your prayer language. When you start to doubt God, pray in your prayer language. So that's what the prayer language does. It helps me build myself up. You know, when I'm all about myself, I can now just go ahead and pray in my prayer language. And it'll help build me up. It'll help encourage me. It'll help comfort me. Oh, come on, somebody. Romans 8, 26. 
Ooh, I'm doing good time. Almost done. Romans 8, 26. Because when we rebuild the broken place of prayer, not only do we have to build our natural, our natural prayer, but we also have to build our spiritual prayer. Romans 8, 26. Very familiar passages, passages of scripture. Likewise, the spirit also helps our infirmities, which is also weaknesses. Likewise, the spirit also helps our weaknesses, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought to. Ooh, ooh. Y'all see this next part? I know everybody's looking up at the screen. But the spirit itself make it what? Intercession for us. Where groanings would not cannot be uttered. Verse number 27. And he that searches the heart knoweth what is the mind of the spirit. Because he makes intercession for us, the saints, according to the will of God. So you mean when, when, when I don't even know what to pray for, that out of my belly shall flow rivers of flowing water, that something will come up out of me and it will begin to pray for me? It will intercede on my behalf. But watch this. When the Spirit prays for you, it just don't pray just to be saying something. It's praying the perfect will of God for your situation. Now I need to go back and say, Holy Ghost, now what did you say? Ooh. If we ought to rebuild the place of prayer, I need to pray it and then get an understanding of what I pray. Because when I pray in the Holy Ghost, it begins now to unlock the angelic language. Don't you know that you have authority? I'm a king. The Bible says that we are kings and priests. Kings have authority. And watch this. Your authority is in the natural and your authority is in the angelic. I send angels on assignment so I have to know their language so that they can understand what I'm saying. Mm -mm -mm. When I don't know for my situation, I have to go in the power of the Holy Spirit so that now I can pray the perfect will of God. Then I come back and say, God, what did I just say? So I know what the perfect will is because I just prayed it. But what we've been doing is just we've been praying in the unknown tongue and then we finish and we go on about our business. No, no, no. Would you pray? That deep. I don't know about anybody else. That deep. Ah. When, when we don't have the words to say, the Holy Spirit overrides our natural man and begins to intercede on our behalf. So God has given us an internal override. We got an internal override. Somebody say I have an internal override. So when you're down and out, hit the override. When you don't know what to do, hit the override. When you don't know what to say or how to say it, hit the override. When you need encouragement, hit the override. When you need wisdom. Mm -hmm. Come on, somebody. Yeah, right. Come on, it's an overlook test. Now hit the what? Right. When you're sick and tired yeah. of being sick and tired, yeah. hit the override. When you feel like giving up, yeah. hit the override. Yeah. When you've cried your last tear, yeah. woo, yeah. get yourself together, mm -hmm. throw your shoulders back, yeah. put your head up high, yeah. and hit the override. When all hope is gone, hit the override. <laughs> when I'm in despair, I hit the override. When I prayed all I could pray and can't pray no more, I hit the override. When I feel empty, I have to hit the override. When I start feeling stressed, I got to Hit the override. When I don't understand what's happening to me, I got to hit the override. When I don't know why, I got to hit the override. When I'm questioning God, I got to hit the override. When I can't sleep at night, I got to hit the override. When you start worrying about your children, hit the override. 
when your spouse starts acting crazy. Don't get crazy with them. Just hit the override. When you need to know your next move in life, hit the override. What we have to do is learn how to hit the override. Because the Spirit wants to intercede on your behalf the perfect will of God. I don't even know how to pray the perfect will of God. But on the inside of me is God. And He's trying to let His will come out. Not my will. Your will. I know the plans that I have for you. And if He knows the plans, He will pray them out for me. Yeah, come on somebody, I get into my closet and I hit the override. Yeah, when they mess up, when they give me, make me mad at work, I go in my office, shut my door, and I hit the override. We have to learn how to go in prayer, but strategically hit the override. Let God do the work. Jesus is on the right hand of God, and he's ever making intercession for us. He is our Override. Yes. 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 I am a spirit. I have a soul and I live in a body, and so therefore I have access to heaven. And if I have access to heaven, then I can speak like they speak in heaven. Paul said he did. Yes. Problem is, we thought we was in this world. We, we thought we was of this world. We ain't of this world. We just in this world. Somebody say, I got the keys. I'm an ambassador. I'm an ambassador for heaven down here on earth. I don't know. Not that one ambassador don't speak the, don't speak the language of the place that they from. I don't know who that was for, but I don't know not that one ambassador that don't know how to speak the language of the place that they represent. The Bible says that we are ambassadors for Christ. Do you know what that means? That means that you have diplomatic immunity from poverty, from sickness, from death. Nobody's going to lay hands on you. I'm telling you, this week, you go out of here and you say, God, I want your Holy Ghost. I want to hit the override. I was driving in my car in a Baptist church, riding down the road, and I began to speak in an unknown language. Nobody laid hands on me. I didn't tear it. I didn't do any of that stuff. It just came up. Some of you are hearing your language, but you're afraid to open your mouth and let your language out. Because it's scaring you. I remember Pastor D, she was in college. She's always in college, but Pastor D was in college. And she was walking around campus. And she came home and she said, I keep hearing this language in my head. I said, well, what's it saying? She said, I don't know. Another couple days went by. Next thing I know, she opened up her mouth. And she began to pray in her prayer language. I'm going to tell you, you are no less a Christian without exercising the right of praying in an unknown language. You are just as born again as the person running around here shouting all loud being all spiritual with no understanding. I don't want you to think less of yourself because you have not done it. You just have not done it. That don't mean that you don't have it. That just means that you have not. You just have not exercised one of the rights that you have as a heaven citizen. As a kingdom citizen. That's all. That's all. But let me tell you, when it does come up, 
Once you're done, tell God to tell you what he was talking about. So that both of y'all could have been in on it. Is that all right? Did you get something out of this today? Well, we never want to leave our broadcast here because we are broadcasting all over. Uh, without giving you an opportunity to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and personal Savior. So all over the room, just repeat after me. Dear Father, Dear Father I, believe I believe Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. And I believe that on the third day, God raised Jesus from the dead. Come into my heart. Fill me with your spirit. In Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, we believe that you got born again. The Bible says, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe that God raised him on the third day, you shall be saved. That's what we base salvation on. We didn't have to even tarry for that. All we did was ask for it. The power of the Holy Spirit, all we do is ask for it. Ah, ah. We thank you. We love you for joining us today. God bless you. Hallelujah, somebody.